Hello, Mason. Welcome to the Wax Museum. Thank you for having me. Um, so I, I know uh, one of those, the things that you talk about on your website is liberation theology. So I thought that'd mm -hmm. be a good thing to start talking about. And I like doing my research on Wikipedia because I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm like that. It's actually and, a really uh, pretty good resource, to be honest. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's actually quite um, great. I know it's kind of funny, actually. It's it's. I mean, obviously, you got to double check it. But um, so basically, what Wikipedia said was that uh, liberation theology is the synthesis of Christian theology and socio-economic analysis that emphasizes social concern to the poor and political liberation for oppressed peoples. Does that sound about right to you? That sounds, I mean, Wikipedia couldn't have said it any better. They stole my words, stole my thunder, <laughs> Wikipedia. <laughs> maybe you wrote it. I, it. Maybe in my sleep I did. I, <laughs> I don't have any conscious memory of, of writing that, but because uh, I don't think I could have come up with that a good of, uh, good of a sentence for, for uh, liberation theology, but maybe my, my unconscious uh, has a little bit better uh, way of articulating it. <laughs> So I, I guess this would be like, because this is something I kind of obsess about is like, um, I think it was Richard Rohr that was talking about the Apostles' Creed, where it's like, Jesus was, you know, born of a virgin, and then he mm -hmm. suffered under Pontius Pilate. And then, you know, and it's like, there's like a gap in the Apostles' Creed where it doesn't yes. really talk about his life. Mm -hmm. And so would you say liberation theology is actually saying, okay, let's take the teachings of Christ and actually put it into action. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Um, it's part of the reason why, you know, and this can get me in lots of controversy, but it's part of the reason why I'm not particularly creedal in my confession mm. to Christianity. Um, I have a theological issues with the creeds. Um, mm. And, but uh, with that said, yeah, I think the Apostles' Creed in particular really leaves out uh, essentially 32 years of Jesus's 33 years of life, uh, which seems to be a pretty significant amount of his life to, to leave out, uh, considering that you're literally trying to call him the Christ in this creed, right? Uh, you might want to add a little bit more to it. So yes, I, I think liberation theology in particular is trying to directly uh, theologize and think about, uh, especially as it relates to our material world, as it relates to our lived existence, how we are supposed to live the follow or the the teaching and example of Jesus uh, and liberation theology kind of puts that forefront it puts that in the center um, of the the Christian life it puts that in the center of one's theology um, and so it's part of the reason why I'm really interested in it um, you know and, and this isn't to say that all theology is like this but a lot of theology sort of sits in that abstract world um, mm -hmm. And I think, you know, more or less, that's fine. Uh, but what liberation theology is really trying to do is make theology, to make Christianity, to make uh, the teachings of Jesus really come to life in concrete ways in our lived experience. Um, and so when liberation theology first emerged in Latin America in the 1960s, it was directly uh, addressing the, the material uh, conditions of the oppressed people uh, in Latin America in the 1960s. As mm -hmm. you know, then it emerged uh, from James Cone into black liberation theology and then started directly uh, addressing the oppressive um, existence, the oppressive life that black people in America experience um, mm -hmm. through uh, the, the leadership of James Cone. Um, and, and it has only morphed into even different branches since then. You have womanist theology, which mm -hmm. is really, you know, sort of under that umbrella. You have queer theology, which is mm -hmm. also under that umbrella, um, and so on and so forth. Um, and, but all of it sort of uh, catalyzed from that very beginning of the, this really deep urging by Latin American uh, liberation theologians in the 1960s to really consider how theology really truly manifests in our material conditions and how we are to live uh, the followings and teachings of Jesus in our lives in our particular context, um, especially as it relates to uh, the poor and the oppressed. So within Latin America, you know, when they started working at, you know, bringing equality, did they do that through the church initially, or did they kind of push, you know, government to do so? Like, how did that work? 
Yeah, I think there was, uh, it's, it was sort of both and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, certainly there were a lot of issues that were happening in terms of corruptness uh, or corruption within the church. Uh, mm -hmm. And so liberation theology was obviously directly addressing the corruption that was happening within the church. Uh, it just so happened that most of the Latin American theologians at that time were Catholic. And so it was, you know, directly addressing the, the corruption in the Catholic church in particular. Um, also, obviously, with, with the government having a significant power in their uh, their lived experience, uh, especially as it, the government relates to their oppression, uh, mm -hmm. they were having a lot of uh, conversation and they were trying to directly address how the government ought to relate to its citizens as well. Um, and obviously thinking that through a theological lens. And so I think it's sort of both and. It was certainly addressing the ways in which the church ought to live uh, a life of liberation, but also was trying to directly address uh, the government as well. And also just the general society and culture at large um, of how we are to live together, um, specifically spawning from uh, our, our commitments as Christians trying to follow the teachings and example of Jesus. So I, I like to kind of probe on Facebook every once in a while and kind of, and I, very conservative people on my Facebook feed. Um, and one of the questions I had asked was, give me an example of a false gospel. And somebody actually listed liberation theology. Do you, do you have any idea why someone would say that liberation theology mm. is a false gospel? Yeah, so I think a lot of conservative theology, whether it's evangelical, Catholic, so on and so forth, finds a lot of issue with a kind of theology that is trying to uh, directly address the problems of the world. Mm. A lot of theology is trying to uh, be otherworldly. It's trying to get us out of this world. It's trying to save us from this world. Right. And liberation theology is trying to save us for this world, for the sake of this world, trying mm. to be, a, trying to save the world itself. And so I think that would be probably the main impetus behind somebody really considering it to be a false gospel is because they're concerned that liberation theology is starting to think about the Christian life, to think about theology, to think about Christ in ways that actually care about this world and not trying to save us away or against this world. Because I, and I, I've listened to like some conservative podcasts where they kind of imply that the whole like social justice movement mm -hmm. is based on this premise that we need to bring heaven here on earth for our salvation. Is that like, to me, that sounds like an improper reading of what you are doing. Oh, I, I mean, I, I mean, I think there is this level of what liberation theology sort of thinks about as, uh, you know, Jesus talking about the kingdom of God, um, mm -hmm. Jesus's words. I, I mean, I think they're good feminist theologians that would say maybe we should say maybe kingdom of God or reign of God, or there might be other better terminology mm -hmm. for us to use. But Jesus' literal words were kingdom of God, but nonetheless, but what Jesus was talking about was the kingdom of God is near. It's mm -hmm. at hand. Uh, yeah. And, and so it, Jesus never talked about the kingdom of God as this thing that was distant yeah. and a part yeah. of the world. It was this, this manifestation of what God hopes and dreams and longs for the world happening in the world. And so yeah. I, I, I just do not understand how one could read the Gospels and think that Jesus is talking about this sort of place that exists outside of the world. Uh, yeah. When Jesus was talking about the kingdom of God, he was not talking about this uh, other dimensional space, yeah. uh, what we would maybe consider heaven. Jesus was not talking about that. Mm -hmm. Jesus was talking about a way in which we live in the world here and now, uh, and that he foresaw a, a way in which all of the world was in harmony and in uh, shalom with one another. And that was the kingdom of God. That's when the kingdom of God would be manifested and realized. Um, and it wasn't, again, apart from the world. It was happening in the world. So, it, but it's still not like a workspace salvation. You know, like you're not saying, hey, right. once, once we bring the kingdom, we're saved. It's more like, you know, it's like he's calling us to change the world. Mm -hmm. And like, cause I, like to me, 
a lot of this boils down to like kind of like Calvinism, which mm-hmm. I think was was something I found in your bio, <laughs> where you were saying you're John Calvin's worst nightmare. Um, but it's like with the Calvinism, I feel like a lot of the conversation goes into what's the bare minimum to get into heaven. Right. And every time it comes to that conversation, I'm like, I'm not interested in this conversation. Like, I'm not right. interested in trying to figure out what the bare minimum is because they say it's only through faith that you're saved. Right. But then the Bible says faith without works is dead. And so really what you're, what that person is asking is, can I get into heaven with dead faith? And I'm like, why would you want to mm-hmm. get into heaven with mm-hmm. dead faith? Yeah. And so like, to me, I, there's got to be some action. You've got to actually um, allow yourself to be changed in the image, you know, of God. Mm-hmm. I, I think if your assumption is that the purpose of salvation is to save you from the world, then mm-hmm. I think it is a it is a fair question on whether or not we can do certain things in order to be saved in that way. But if you completely reconfigure your conception of salvation and not a salvation from the world, but a salvation for the world, then the question of what, what you need to do or whether or not what you can do is worthy of salvation, that question just becomes obsolete. If, you're, if your assumption is that salvation is for the world, then your, the demand placed on you, what you're supposed to do as a Christian, your responsibility as a Christian is supposed to be doing certain work in the world that manifests what Jesus was talking about with the kingdom of God. And uh, I don't think it's a question on whether or not uh, if you're doing enough to manifest that kingdom mm-hmm. of God that you mm-hmm. then are therefore saved or not saved. That becomes an obsolete question because the the salvation is for the world and not for for yourself from the world. Yeah. Well, and I, and I always think too, like these things, you know, like it's, you know, my yoke is a featherweight, you know, my, <laughs> well, I actually quote a to- Toby Mac there, but <laughs> <laughs> Jesus close enough. My, my yoke is easy. Right. And my burden is light there. That's actual scripture. <laughs> <laughs> the CCM theologian. No. Um, but, uh, but it, like, I think about that all the time when, you know, I feel like, oh, I've got to do this. I feel like I feel like I need to do this and I'm supposed to be doing this. And um, I think sometimes we allow that to be too much of a burden when a lot of times I think it, the reality is, you know, I don't know if you don't have any children, do you? I do not. No. But when you have a little kid that wants to help you, like, sweep the floor and they're like, mm-hmm. can I help sweep the floor? And you're like, okay. And it's just a joy to kind of watch them try, even though they yeah. really suck at it. I think sometimes mm-hmm. <laughs> that's, that's what my calling is, is like, it's just like, he just wants to watch me do it. Like, it's not that, oh my gosh, I would not be able to do this podcast without John. You know, it's like, and so there's a joy in serving. There's a joy in being able to be a part of this mm-hmm. liberation. Mm-hmm. And you play a small role in this bigger picture of what God's already doing. Right. No, and, and I think, and this is what I, I think is beautiful about the kingdom of God, especially in the way that Jesus articulated it, was that this is a thing that everybody can participate in. Yes. Regardless if you're Jewish or Greek, mm-hmm. a man or a woman, a child mm-hmm. or an adult, so on and so forth. Yeah. You are able to contribute to this kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. Um, And that, I think, is really a beautiful vision for how we should think about the world. Um, And it's part of, you know, the main impetus in in my own theology of wanting to include as many people who uh, are able to contribute this to this that want to see the salvation of the world, whether it be a child, whether it be a poet, whether it Mm -hmm. be a theologian, whether it be a teacher, whether it be a musician whoever it is, I see that their work in one particular way or not is contributing to that. And that's how I want to sort of see my theology. I want to see it as this kind of all encompassing way in which it can be manifested in different ways, whether it's music, education, uh, a childhood's dreams, whatever it might be. That's how I see theology really being manifested. It's not in the, uh, in the, the, the uh, academy, 
It's not in the yeah. four walls of the church. The theology is happening all around us by lots of different people because they're all contributing to what I think Jesus was calling the kingdom of God. Oh man, and it's a movement. And it's like, people want to join this movement. It's exciting. Mm -hmm. It's not, you know, like, I've got to convince people that their life is terrible if they don't have Jesus. It's like, I could just demonstrate this is Jesus working. You right. want to participate in this, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so your latest blog is a paper that is a comparison of theolo theologies of creation mm -hmm. um, from uh, Catherine Keller and Dietrich Bonhoeffer. So you're comparing these two different mm -hmm. theologies of creation. And it got me curious because I'm just like, okay, well, liberation theology is all about bringing God's kingdom to here. But like, what is, what is the creation? How does the creation story have any bearing on liberation theology? Right. Yeah. I, I think it has a lot. Uh, mm. I, I think it's just absolutely rich uh, and rife with potential for liberation theology. I think for Catherine Keller in particular, um, I won't go so much into Bonhoeffer's work just because I'm, you know, I wrote a paper about it, but I'm not, I, I don't want to like say that I, I know Bonhoeffer as well as I know Catherine Keller, but with Catherine Keller's work on her particular theology of creation, she talks about creation as this, uh, that creation itself has, it, it's animated in a way where it creates uh, beyond itself. Um, and mm. so what, one of the, in, the, in the, the primary book that I used in that paper from her um, called Face of the Deep, she talks about creation co-creating alongside of, with God. So mm. God wasn't creating something out of nothing, but that creation was creating alongside with God. Um, and so she, her argument in Genesis 1 uh, specifically is that uh, creation was creating alongside with God. Um, and the reason why I think that matters, the way we think about that, is because if we start thinking about creation having the agency and power to create with itself, it is not, it, therefore, uh, it's not completely reliant on the doing of God. We don't have to wait on God to manifest these things in the world, the kind of creation that we want to see in the world. We ourselves as creation have the power and agency to do that alongside with God. God hmm. will continue to do that work, of course, but we don't have to wait on God's doing alone for that to be manifested. So we're called as, as humans to participate in the manifestation of the kingdom of God God is certainly going to be doing the work that God can do to make that happen. But humans are also called to be participants in that as well. So we have the agency and power to actually manifest, help manifest the kingdom of God as well, again, alongside with God. It doesn't take God out of the equation, but what it does is it empowers us to create alongside with God rather than waiting on God's doing alone. That's crazy, like, because I always think about the creative process, and I, I do songwriting, and mm -hmm. I, I have a kid that does songwriting, too, and we're always, like, creating stuff, and I'm just, like, I'm always saying to him, I'm, like, so where does this come from? Because I, I feel like I'm always discovering something that's already there, right? It's, like, mm -hmm. you know, when you talk about, like, the sculptor that's, like, I just chip away the pieces of the rock that don't belong to the statue. Right. I mean, that's essentially what the creative process is with just about everything I do. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's that, I think that's evidence of what you're talking about. It's like, it's like creation is continuously unfolding mm -hmm. and we can I participate in that. Absolutely. I, I mean, I, I see a guitar behind you. Um, maybe you're a, a songwriter um, with guitars or not, but like one of the things that, um, my favorite musician talks about is that a song is never finished. It's only mm. started. Uh, it's mm. only one, it's only written. Um, and the way that he, the, the, what the meaning behind that is that um, even after a song has been recorded or whatever, and has been put out on an album or been released, that's still not the ending of that song. That song is going to take on def, certainly different manifestations. Maybe it's covered by somebody. Mm -hmm. um, uh, maybe at some point, certainly it's probably going to be played live and it's going to be played differently, potentially live. There's different manifestations the song can take on uh, that are not maybe necessarily what we would consider the final product of its, you know, its, its, studio, uh, its studio version. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I think if we understand even something like music in that light of the song is never completed, it's only written or it's only started, 
we, if we think about creation in that way, then it, we allow ourselves for creation to be constantly unfolding into the just and the, the beautiful. And so I, I'm really convinced that, we, that creation can only do that unfolding if it has the power and agency to actually do that kind of work and that we aren't completely reliant on the doing of God for that. Um, and so I, I think that's part of the reason why it's not only beautiful to think of creation as this constant unfolding, but also I think it's actually empowering for us to think about how it's unfolding because it empowers us to actually manifest, again, what Jesus was articulating in this language of kingdom of God. Well, I, I think like this too, like when you talk about like the will of God and how like a lot of times, mostly in charismania, charismania, whatever you call it. <laughs> I'm trying to make up a word here. It's failing. But um, it's this whole idea. It's like, well, should I, should I bike to work or should I drive to work? Well, I got to ask the Holy Spirit. And there's just mm -hmm. things, you know, at a point, you know, when people get so hung up on the will of God all the time, it's like, you know what? He's just giving you choices. I think most things are just choices. And he's just like, you know what? Just pick one. Like, I don't care. It's all good. And um, I think that's another... Another, you know, thing that can be cumbersome is when you're waiting for God all the time and God's just like, just pick one. Mm -hmm. I think that most of life is like that. He's like, just mm -hmm. pick one. Don't care. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I just find it in, in my own life to be really burdensome if mm -hmm. I'm only relying on what I think the voice of God is telling me to do. Um, when I... Uh, I, I think it was an incredibly empowering experience when I finally allowed myself theologically to have permission to make the choices that I make and mm -hmm. to therefore uh, consider those choices to be uh, what God was willing in my life rather than mm -hmm. waiting, as you mentioned before, uh, rather than this waiting on God to make these decisions for myself. Um, I think it's a truly empowering experience to, to experience that. So I, I find for me, it's like, I just have my obsessions, right? And I will just obsess over an idea and I'm like, oh, I got to have a guy on the podcast to talk about that or, you know, and, um, or I got to write about this. Like I'll start mm -hmm. writing, you know, a song about some topic um, that I've been obsessing over. So you, you have a podcast, um, A People's mm -hmm. Theology. Um, tell me about your show. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean... We're, you know, we're talking about liberation theology. I think, you know, what I'm really trying to do is share those voices that I think are mm -hmm. doing a lot of liberation theology. Um, again, you know, as I mentioned before, you know, I find theology to be manifested by poets and musicians and children and so on and yeah. so forth. And so yeah. what I'm really wanting to do is to uh, talk with people who I think are, are doing uh, both inspiring and liberating theology uh, from a variety of different ways, uh, whether they're theologians or, again, musicians or poets or authors or uh, whatever it might be. Um, I, I'm trying to chat with those folks about what that is uh, to share their voices a little bit more um, uh, because I, I, just think I find it really important work. Um, and again, I, I find it extremely inspiring and liberating. And I think lots of other people are looking for that same kind of theology from a variety of different kind of people. Good. I, I really like the way you feature music and mm. musicians. Lots of people in have mentioned podcast. that before. Sorry? Lots of people have mentioned that. Uh, I, I find yeah. it so interesting. I, I, I'm just doing it because I'm a music fan and I just want to share other music, but I, I yeah. don't like think of it as, oh, other people really like this. I should do it. So I just find it, I, <laughs> it's great that it actually ends up uh, playing out really well for, for listeners. I, I, know, I know what you're saying. Like, I've just, like, honestly, I, I always think of like, this is not going to sound very nice, but it's like Henry Ford. He said, if I asked the people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. Right. And I kind of, I kind of feel that way about the general public. So I just do right. whatever I want. And it's like, if people catch on, that's great. If not, I'm just going to keep doing it because I enjoy it. Right. And so I'm like, it's, it's, it's shocking, I guess. Hey, when, when people actually are like, I really like this. And you're like, Oh, that's funny. I didn't even think someone would like it. I just wanted <laughs> to do this. Um, and so, so you did this, uh, epi this feature on Athena, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. and I, I love this idea of deep ideas being displayed in deceptively catchy, catchy pop music. Yeah. She, she had that great line. It was awesome. 
It is. It is. And I, I love, you know, all those songs that you listen to that you're like, man, this song's catchy. And it's like, yeah, it's about suicide. And you're like, what? Yeah. Really? Yeah. And those are just some of my favorite songs is like when there's just, it's deceptively catchy. Reminds me of like pumped up kids or pump, yes. pumped up kicks. Yeah. Right. That's, that's a prime mm -hmm. example right there. Yeah. 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 That's like, uh, yeah, that's, that's like the, the exemplar of that kind of pop, pop song, uh, catchy, but uh, extremely dark lyrics. So what I, what I keep encountering, and I think this is really the crux of why the Wax Museum exists and why I say these are conversations that need to be had. Mm -hmm. um, I always find that there's something that I feel is being very misunderstood. Um, and so, you know, a couple episodes back, I did socialism because I'm like, people do not understand, the, you know, socialism. And so mm -hmm. we really were able to delve into that and, you know, dispel some of the myths. And I think really, you know, when you and I were going back and forth on Twitter, this was kind of what I thought the crux was with this was um, this whole idea of defund the police. I feel like mm. generally speaking, actually, I don't know if anybody really understands what it means. There's very few. Would you be able to explain to me what that means to you? What defund the police would mean? Yeah, well, let me first start by saying what I, it could also mean to other people, but what I mean behind it is, mm -hmm. well, first, so I think a lot of people use it as this sort of uh, declaration that something needs to be, something needs to happen among our policing in America, mm -hmm. especially as it relates to police brutality um, against oppressed uh, communities. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think it can kind of, it's, it's such, especially in the last few months, has really taken on this life of sort of a like strictly like kind of anti-policing tone. Mm -hmm. um, but can maybe, despite the fact that it says defunding, it sometimes might not actually really articulate much of like what that actually could look like. Mm -hmm. um, there also are other people that might use that phrase and they, when they mean by defunding the police, they mean like we want to lessen the funding that the police receives or we we uh we reform the way in which policing happens um mm -hmm. so that that's another option or another kind of group of people that use that um my uh, declaration behind it and this is just especially within the last few months has been really um uh catalyzed by uh my experiences in minneapolis because i live here uh, in Minneapolis and sort of because of the mermaids I was already sort of feeling in my own soul about this but when I say it I mean like we need to abolish the police like it's not just simply a defunding but we mm. need to completely altogether get that system out um, mm. that, that system should not exist as it uh, currently exists and that we need to think about other ways in which we can keep communities safe um, mm. Uh, that does not resort to the system of uh, and system and structure of police. And so when I talk about defunding the police, that's what I mean. It really is just another way for me to say abolish the police. Um, hmm. There are a lot of people who might use that phrase of defunding the police, and that's not at all what they mean. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I want to acknowledge that at the very least. I think yeah. they're wrong, but I, uh, yeah. I want to at least acknowledge that that exists in the way that they use it. Um, but when I talk about it, and I think you're totally right that it's been greatly misunderstood because there's lots of different people who are competing for a voice uh, under that uh, phrase of defund the police, and they all mean different things by it, which makes mm -hmm. it really confusing and complex. Yeah. Uh, so I, I understand the confusion behind it because it means lots of different things to lots of different people. Um, but when I talk about it, that's what I mean. I am full on uh, for uh, abolishing uh, the police and prison systems in America. Wow. Yeah. Well, you know, it's really interesting because my last episode I did, which was 80, episode 83, we were talking about capitalism. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I wanted, you know, after we did a couple episodes about socialism, I'm like, okay, let's give, let's give capitalism its full, <laughs> it's fill, full once over. And um, it was interesting because like my friend Brad, he, he talked about um, policing and he talked about prisons and said that like for-profit prisons are an awful thing. Like he's not mm -hmm. for for-profit prisons. Um, he was saying like, and both Brad and I live in Canada 
and Canada's criminal justice system is more driven toward um, toward rehabilitation mm -hmm. than it is for retribution. And it seems like in America, they're trying to do retribution, and that's why you still have capital punishment in a lot of states. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so even from like the capitalist point of view, he was like saying, here's the thing. We want to rehabilitate, and we want to keep people in prison as short a time as possible so they can be rehabilitated and put back into society because it's too expensive <laughs> to keep them in prison. And I'm like, that's interesting how that capitalist incentive actually works in the favor right. of doing the kinder thing. Um, the other thing that I thought was really interesting is when he was talking about policing, he was like, we don't have police going around neighborhoods trying to enforce arbitrary laws. He's like, the police should only be brought into a situation where there's a dispute, like where it's like someone calls the police in because something's out of hand. They're not sitting there, you know, trying to enforce speeding laws. If no one's complaining about it, they don't need to enforce it, right? And I was like, that's interesting. So would that be, would it be more along those lines if you were to abolish the prison, abolish the police? Would it be more so police being less interventionist? Uh, I, I mean, like, based on what I'm hoping for, I, mm -hmm. it's not even just less intervention, but there is just no intervention at all because they don't exist. Like, right. I think there's other ways in which we can com keep communities safe that doesn't rely on armed people mm -hmm. who are out there to enforce certain laws. Um, okay. That, that in and of itself, I find to be the issue. It's not that they're not doing the system very well. I think for people who are kind of looking for police reform, they sort of see that the, the system of the police is this pure thing and just certain individuals or even groups of police departments are just not doing it very well. I don't think that's the case. I think it's just that the system itself is an evil system that should not exist. Um, mm. So uh for i find it interesting like I, like I, i've totally i have my best friend's a libert uh libertarian and so like i've heard that kind of like pro capitalist uh yeah. perspective on like defunding the police and like right. to ending for-profit prisons and stuff uh, at the end of the day um here's the like what i find to be the issue with that though is the point of capitalism is that there is a protection of property right you, right. you have private property and yeah. that is sort of the the stronghold that is the yes. the foundation of capitalism so in my belief that private property shouldn't exist um th there is no need for police but the, I, I just do not understand how it would be possible to uphold a system that its found, very foundation is private property, and you would not have a system that protects that private property, which is right. why I would argue that police exist, is to protect private property. Um, right. You have different uh, armed uh, law enforcement, uh, whether it's the police, CIA, ATF, whatever, but they're all, their main mission, regardless if, if it's implicit or not, is to protect private property. And so mm -hmm. if you get rid of that notion of private property, as you would in like a more Marxist system or something, the need for police uh, becomes non-existent. And so, so yeah, no that, that would be my argument sort of against that. So there's no private property, so there's no theft. Um, is it state-owned everything then? Or how does that work? Yeah, so it'd be like, I mean, like, for example, like there would be, like nobody would own their individual house. We sort of collectively together own our different, um, uh, or we not even own necessarily, but we all collectively live uh, in different housing. And so... Uh, for example, like right now, for example, there's lots of private property of housing all across the nation. More, um, uh, there's more uh, vacant private property housing that exists than there are people experiencing homelessness. Yeah. In America. Yeah. I don't, maybe it's different in Canada, but in America, that, that's true. Yeah. And, and if, if private property didn't exist, that wouldn't be an issue. Hmm. But because of the protection of private property, people who are experiencing homelessness can't have housing because other people, regardless if it's vacant or not, are not, uh, they, their, their private property is protected and therefore uh, they uh, don't need to house people who are experiencing homelessness, right? And so like an issue like that would become completely obsolete 
uh, when something like um, something like uh, private property ends up becoming obsolete as well. Um, so I, I will say here the other thing too, and, and th this is where I like I, I'm not super well educated in this. I, at this mm -hmm. point, I'm just sort of like speaking the best I know. But there's much mm -hmm. much smarter people to talk about this that you should totally have on your podcast about mm -hmm. it. Um, I, I would uh, I would adequately like to describe myself. I, I would say I rightfully pass as an anarchist, meaning that I don't mm. believe the state should own any of these things either, that we should yes. sort of collectively as a group of people uh, make these agreements, but we don't have some sort of um, institution that's governing uh, this, um, th this public property, if you will. That um, is interesting. So, yes, uh, I, I would say most anarchists are kind of in that boat of they don't see the state as a viable option in protecting uh, public property or this sort of collective property. Um, and I think they might be on to something. But again, yeah. that is pretty much the extent that I know about that kind well, of topic. And that's much more in the theolo theology world. Uh, so it's really hard for me to talk really specifically about some of these things. But it's like, it's, it's more so about like localizing government as much as possible, you know, like where instead of saying, well, let's have this, you know, like even like within Canada, you know, we've got like multiple provinces across the country and some of the provinces, like the province I live in right now feels kind of alienated and they don't feel like the federal government is hearing them. Mm -hmm. And so the more we localize government and say, okay, well, what if we gave provinces more power and it's like, okay, well, that'd be nice. But it's like, but I don't know if the whole, like the central provincial government really hears us either. And so you're like, well, what about municipal government? And then you're like, mm -hmm. well, I don't know if the city really hears my community. And so like, let's give the community more power. And eventually really you end up with mon or anarchy as you get tighter and tighter, you know, I guess more and more um, granular in how you're looking at your situation. Mm -hmm. And so I think the more I think about it too, I, I lean towards anarchist, but with a global vision. Like mm -hmm. I think the idea of individualism and it's just like, screw everybody else, you know, <laughs> like is like, okay, that's a problem. But it's right. like, so somehow tethered to kind of a, a somebody with, kind of a view of where the world's headed, what's best for the world, if we could all go in the same direction and I guess reduce carbon emissions or whatever, right? Uh, solve COVID, that'd be awesome, right? And so I, but it's so funny though, like you bring up the word anarchists and I keep hearing, you know, like all the, you know, they're anarchists flipping over, you know, cars and burning things. And I'm like, you guys don't know what anarchists are, do you? Right. Yeah, and again, I, I'm totally fine with that sort of localization in so far that private property is abolished. Uh, right. I, I, I still don't think like even the more localized you become, if you still uphold private property, you will have boring. people, you have people who will still hoard resources uh, and hoard their property and weaponize that against those who don't have as much. Um, mm -hmm. And Therefore, I really still think that at the end of the day, regardless of whether it's more localized or nationalized or whatever, at the end of the day, uh, private property has to be abolished because of the way in which that it um, is unequally, uh, uh, the, the way in which property is unequally distributed across different people groups. Do you think there's a biblical argument for this lack of private property? Yeah, I mean, I think the book of Acts is rife with this. I mean, I think the mm. first followers of Jesus quite literally were giving away their resources mm -hmm. and the, the few resources that they did need to survive as a, as a group of people, they just shared that collectively. They shared that together. Nobody owned one specific thing. Uh, they didn't, uh, want, it wasn't like one person owned housing or whatever, it might, or food or whatever it might be. They all collectively lived together in harmony sharing resources um i mean jesus talks about this all the time with people who are rich i mean he's constantly throughout the gospels condemning people who are rich and telling them to essentially what we would say in modern terms is to redistribute your wealth mm. uh, to literally give this away 
and follow me. Uh, you were not able to follow Jesus if you didn't do that. Um, and so I really do think at the end of the day that you have to give away your capital, if you will, uh, in order to be a, a good follower of Jesus. Um, and so I think that the first followers of Jesus did this remarkably well. And uh, I really wish we could look at their example as ways in which we can live into that uh, in the 21st century. Hmm. Very interesting. I, I, you know, and I, I think what's, um, I think what terrifies people is the idea that they would be forced to give up their private property. Oh yeah. I mean, they're not going to be, they're not going to do that just willy nilly. Right. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think that, you know, like any kind of shift like that. And I think that's why when we talked about like socialism, it was more so like working within the capitalistic system and like saying, okay, well, let's build some worker co-ops. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, okay, well, that's kind of a neat idea. That's something I would be willing to experiment with one day mm -hmm. and just say like, okay, me and two other, two other people, we're going to build a company and we're going to split everything three ways, you know, but within a capitalist system where we split the profits all the time, but it's like, there's no hierarchy. Right. Mm -hmm. And to, to start with a society that is so rife with capitalism and rugged individualism, I mean, that's, that's a huge shift that I don't know. I don't even know where you begin with that. It's, it's extreme. I mean, it really is this. And this is why I think theology is really helpful in, mm -hmm. in, in this world is theology has the power to imagine this world. Yeah, it has the power to do this. And that's why I think theology needs to be part of this conversation. If we're going to manifest these sort of what I would, again, consider the values and, and characteristics of the kingdom of God, if we're going to actually manifest this in the world, theology is going to have to be a part of it. Theology has to be the part of the conversation about the uh, abolition of the police the abolition of prisons, the abolition of private property. It has to be a part of that conversation because theology, unlike a lot of other sort of parts of society, have, has a imagination to think beyond itself because it thinks about the ultimate. It thinks about things through the lens of the divine, through the lens of God. And so because of that, it has the power to actually think about these things really adequately so that we're able to actually manifest these what these values these characteristics of the kingdom of god in practical tangible concrete ways hmm. you've given me lots to think about mm. i it's always it's always fun to just explore these ideas and like and i i feel like people are just so misunderstood and mm -hmm it's good to kind of open up this conversation. And it's funny how like, you know, people want to see a debate and I'm like, I'm becoming more and more disenchanted with debate. In fact, mm -hmm. you have a presidential debate right now. Um, I think yeah, you're I'm missing, missing it, it, aren't which you? Which is great. Yeah, it's great. Came okay. I'm glad, I'm glad you- I don't know why I would watch it, but- <laughs> Yeah, I, as a Canadian, I'm like, I don't understand why any Canadian would care to watch that. But I'm like, in the end, like, I never watch these things. And in the end, I've, we always got the Republicans coming back and saying, like, our side won. And the Democrats are like, our side won. And I'm right. like, yeah, I have a feeling nobody won this And the one. press lost. <laughs> and the press lost. But it's like, in, I just feel like a lot of the um, conversation, particularly on Facebook for me, I find Twitter like not hard for me to communicate at all with people. Maybe I just have a different mm. demographic there, but on Facebook, most of all, I'm just like, you know what? I am done replying to people's comments. Like this is just mm -hmm. dumb. Like nobody's hearing anybody at this point. And so I would rather hear someone out in their entirety on my podcast than have two people debate it. And we could only get to like maybe three points where we could actually talk about seven points and explore them in detail. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I find social media really unhelpful when it comes to debate. Now, with that said, I think social media is extremely helpful in being able to explore certain ideas that you might be unfamiliar with. To yeah. Have discussions, not debates, but discussions with people who might be more knowledgeable on a certain thing than, uh, than you might uh, be uh, on the same thing. And so, and for those reasons, I find social media extremely helpful. And I've loved social media for that reason. 
yeah. I'm more than uninterested on debating people about my theology uh, no. on Twitter or Facebook or wherever it might be. Uh, it's just, it's not an interesting thing. Um, to be honest, and I've, you know, I've been in seminary now for a while. And even in seminary, like, you know, there have been certain times where, you know, I might disagree with somebody um, and more or less are able to have like a, a, mm -hmm. a fruitful conversation from it. But even in that, I'm like, I'm just not interested in the debate about it. No, I'm great. I'm totally fine with disagreement and difference. That is totally fine. And I'm absolutely love being able to discuss through differences and disagreements. But I think if the point of the debate is to either expose the insidiousness of one side or the other, or if the point of the debate is for two sides to come together, that's just uninteresting to me. I want to hear difference and disagreement and talk through those things. Um, now, in so far that those disagreements and difference um, don't side with something like fascism, right? Like I don't think fascism is is worthy of disagreement and uh, difference. I think fascism is worthy of destruction. Uh, we shouldn't be uh, opening space for that. But uh, outside of that, I think disagreement and dis difference are wonderful. And I love that as actually the starting place that one begins conversation and relationship with another. Oh, totally. Well, and I, I think always best practice is to like say, okay, if this is what we agree on and this is where we diverge. Mm -hmm. And just explore where we diverge without even like, it's almost more expository than anything else. It's like, let's explore this. And I mean, you always end up with things. If you're actually going to be open-minded enough to reconsider, you know, your thinking on things, you can actually use your imagination to take yourself to where that person is and explore it and then be like, Oh, it makes a lot of sense now. Why you're saying, you know, for my guy last time, he's just like individual rights are everything. And I'm like, okay, I see where you're coming from because it's not just individual rights for me, it's individual rights for you. So I'm going to fight for your individual rights too. And I'm like, oh, okay. As much as he like, and it was interesting because he, he was basically saying that like, um, I forgot what the word was, but it's like caring about others is, is useless is basically what he said. But then he's saying like, like altruism? altruism, there we go. Yeah. Right. And he's just like, uh, my individual rights and I fight for your individual rights. And I'm like, looking back now, I'm like, that's altruism, dude. But <laughs> it's just, it's just interesting to, to kind of, you know, actually explore it because in the end, you know, what people believe strongly in makes sense to them. So mm -hmm. for us to look at someone and say, oh, you're an anarchist, so you're just dumb and crazy, right. and you just want to destroy property, it's like you haven't heard this person talk. And so I just think it's very important we have these conversations. Yeah, I, I think in a lot of cases, I think you're totally right that for, you know, regardless of where you land on a theological or political or some sort of ideological position, it makes sense for that person. Mm -hmm. I think where disagreement often lies, especially when it comes to politics, even to a lot of theology, is not necessarily does this make sense or does it not make sense. It's does this weaponize power right. or does this use power in generative ways for all people like that right. so there's a difference in power right so it's mm -hmm. not just that i disagree with the conception of calvinist uh calvinist uh conceptions of of god it's not just that that i disagree with some in some abstract way the reason why i disagree with it is the ways in which that conception that theology therefore manifests in ways in which that abuses uh power in lived uh in lived uh experience in in certain people's lives the way it abuses power in women and children yes. and people of color so on and yeah. so forth um so it's not just like does it doesn't make sense to me it's that I think there's actually a misuse of power that's happening here. And that's why I think liberation theology is really insightful, is it's not trying to locate the coherence of a theology or anything. It's, um, its theology is completely rooted in power. Who has power? How do they use that power? 
and what are ways in which we can rethink through that power. That's mm. what liberation theology is really centered on. And I think that's the really great insight of the, uh, liberation theology versus a lot of other theologies out there is it's sort of one of the first theologies that really kind of puts that at the forefront. It, it's not about common sense or the logic of the theology. It's about the power of the theology. Well, thank you so much. This was great. Um, I might have to have you back on to beat up Calvin for a bit. I would love to. I, know. <laughs> I will. I will beat a dead horse in Calvin. So should I just point people to your website? Yeah, great. I mean, yeah, I, my, my website is masonmeninga.com, uh, M-A-S-O-N-M-E-N-N-E-N-G-A.com. Uh, I'm really active on Twitter. Uh, my handle is at Mason Meninga, all one word. Uh, you can follow me. I'm pretty active on Instagram as well. You can follow me there. Uh, same, same exact handle. I have a Patreon. I have my podcast. Actually, I have two podcasts. Uh, the main one is kind of the, the people's theology one. So uh, yeah, check, th check that all out. Uh, give me a follow and uh, leave, leave a comment, leave a reply. I'd love to, love to chat with people about that kind of stuff. So yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.